deaths? Uh, so No More Deaths is was originally a humanitarian organization based in southern Arizona that began in 2004. It was a coalition of community and faith groups. Now, um, since 2008, it's been an official ministry of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tucson, even though um, like we are not necessarily affiliated and everyone that is with No More Deaths isn't necessarily affiliated with the church. And their mission has always been and continues to be to end the death, suffering, and oppression that goes on in the borderlands of Mexico and the United States uh, through civil initiatives. Uh, both, this is everything from uh, direct aid to those crossing, to global movement building, consciousness raising of the citizen public, uh, and encouraging humane immigration policy that takes into account actual history where the freedom of movement has been something integral to how we function as human beings. And the direct aid to, to people who are migrating, that's come under, under a lot of uh, contention recently with a trial with someone who is trying to give water and food to people who are crossing the border. Yeah, um, Warren Scott, he actually, um, it was interesting, the jury actually ended up with a deadlock uh, the first week of, or his trial was on May 29th, and I think it was finalized by the 11th of June. And essentially, uh, when it had been one of the most aggressive attacks on humanitarian aid in relation to immigration uh, in history in terms of how it went, so it was the last of a series of escalating actions taken by federal law enforcement against border-based aid providers in general, especially after the federal administration changed under our unfortunate new president. And he had been most well known, uh, Warren Scott, for going into the most horrific areas of the borderlands where a lot of bodies had come up so that he can document them before evidence was often tampered with or erased by local and federal officials um, so that he could assist those that were seeking safety and getting water, food, shelter, and uh, legal assistance as well. And he had been physically caught at a place called The Barn, which has actually historically been well known uh, in, if I remember correctly, Ajo, A-J-O, Arizona, where a bunch of different activists, meaning college students, uh, medical professionals, law professionals, people from all over of all different um, groups coming together. And that day, uh, uh, two people, a man and a woman, if I remember correctly, both from Honduras, that were fleeing violence. Um, and uh, had, they had held them for three days, giving them food, water, and shelter. And all of a sudden, even though it was private property, and the agents, the ICE agents, had no warrant to come on the property. They, um, in unmarked vehicles, just surrounded it and took both the migrants that he was helping and Warren Scott. And then um, he was held and his trial just happened. And it's up in the air whether or not the federal government is going to retry him. But it sets a great precedent for regular public citizens who were on that jury that day. Um, in a way resisting what was happening with the state oppression. This Friday you're holding a demonstration and vigil in Ybor City. Where is it and why are you holding it and what will happen? So it is uh, 1624 East, 7, East 7th Avenue in front of the Customs and Border Protection Office. Um, if uh, Let me double check if I remember correctly. That is being held at 7 p.m. And uh, what will be happening is a noise demonstration as well as a vigil where there will be large posters and photos of the individuals um, ranging from unborn children and pregnant mothers to all different family members and people that have been murdered on both sides of the border, many of them um, not even seeking to cross. And yes, it is at 7 p.m. And the noise demonstration is to one, when it's a Friday evening, to disrupt the local ongoings in terms of people are just going out to maybe drink or party 
or have a great time uh, when in every moment in this country there are children, there are families, there are individuals that are locked in cages just because they were not born here and they were seeking safety in this country surrounded by borders that are completely made up. There are a few continents that are actually uh, split apart by bodies of water and the United States is not one of them. And so this is um, one, just to hold space for all the individuals whose lives are usually ignored, their narratives are completely misconstrued in the public media most often, and they are demonized um, just for seeking asylum. So we're doing that uh, not only to be in solidarity with them and to call for their freedom, but also to say that humanitarian aid is not and it never should be deemed a crime. Some people have called the places where migrants are, are being uh, held concentration camps, and that, that term has become a hot, uh, you know, a controversial term in, in the last week or so. Uh, what would you say about that whole debate? Well, if uh, I just actually got a, um, a degree in history and philosophy from the University of Tampa, and I specialize mostly in Western and decolonial philosophy, and if we're talking about what makes up a concentration camp, what is the narratives uh, that are used in order to keep them open and in place without public rage and without uh, legal ramifications often, is that you are targeting a specific group of humans based on characteristics that they cannot change. And that is what exactly what's happening with non-citizens in this country. You're saying because uh, you often speak a different language than me if we're talking about the United States, they might speak Spanish or Creole or um, any different language because there are unfortunately people seeking safety from all over the world. Um, that if you weren't born here and you don't have a made up card given to you by a government that existed after your ancestors, then you're not allowed to um, be allowed basic human rights like medical care, food, water, safety, um, and also the conditions that are being documented, the high rates of sexual abuse, physical abuse. They have these things called ice boxes where the government admits they purposefully put um, it at very low temperatures so it makes it very difficult for anyone to um, interact with one another or do anything except sleep, separating families, um, having a national registry. Like that's literally just a list that makes it so that if you're not put in a cage you have to come back every 30 days and check into this racist registry. This is clearly xenophobic and I would very much call it a concentration camp. One of the largest places where migrants are being held is in South Florida in Homestead. What do you know about the Homestead camp? And if you, you know, if, if you don't know much about it that's fine, but it, what, what would you tell people about that and uh, what your thoughts are about the Homestead camp? Also, the Homestead camp is very interesting because um, even myself, having lived here in Florida for 15 years, didn't know up until a year ago that it existed. Uh, it primarily houses children. Uh, we have people up there and with a group that is uh, bearing witness and documenting the conditions um, because often the local and federal officials are not transparent as to what is happening in these places. So just a few days ago, for instance, almost a thousand children were brought in on buses without their parents in the middle of the night. And the people that are supposed to be watching them and making sure that they're safe are the same people, these officers, that are demonizing their very existence in this country. So least to say, um, I don't know the full history of the facility itself, but I do know that consistently and currently um, they're very secretive in how they function. They are not transparent in how many children and people are there um, and what is going on and the status of the children. Um, we constantly are like singing, uh, we like as a group of people that I support, are constantly documenting, singing songs 
trying to fly in letters, doing everything we can to show those children that there are other humans that recognize their humanity and their need and will not rest until they are free. Other presidents have detained migrants as they cross the border, but this, there's one major change that seems to have happened during the Trump administration, and that's this active policy to separate families, to separate children from their, their parents or from their guardians. Uh, what should people know about that? So, uh, in general, yes, unfortunately, under the Obama administration, a lot of these uh, detention camps were opened, but the policy of um, being more aggression, aggressive about the prevention through deterrence program that was started by the federal government in the 1990s um, is unprecedented. And that is one very scary because the little progress that was being made in terms of um, decriminalizing the seeking of safety by humans that are not from here, that can't even be focused on um, trying to even get back the little victories that were happening uh, in terms of reform. Uh, now it's to the point where even more, not just federal and local officers that are given legal authority, but also individual public citizens that are going out of their way to murder, harass, rape, and deter these migrants who in large part are coming here because they are climate refugees, because they are refugees of war. And if we don't pay attention to how the United States um, has continuously perpetrated military coups in the global south in these same countries that are unstable politically and ecologically as well as the federal funds that have gone into making it so that mining companies and fossil fuel companies can make or certain places in the global south often uninhabitable um, ignoring that and completely changing the narrative as Trump has done to the refugee crisis not being one of these people fleeing for their lives, but the fake crisis being something that needs to fuel putting millions and billions of dollars into building a wall that one has shown to be ineffective, two is overtly xenophobic, um, and three has made it much easier to pass both on the local, state, and federal levels policies that are unprecedented, such as um, the sheriff's departments here in Florida, for instance, collaborating with federal agents to um, basically join more so the system of mass incarceration, which is also racist, and the system of immigrant detention, stopping people for things like a broken taillight or things that they're claiming happen that aren't um, like they thought they smelled something or saw something that clearly wasn't there and they were just racially profiling someone so that they could hold them so that ICE agents could detain them. And that these things that are happening are escalating. Like every single day we have more and more reports of violence within the camps, outside of the camps, to those that are resisting, like people that are literally just with PhDs and medical degrees that just want to give people medical care. Like it's getting more severe than in my lifetime we've ever seen. We're also seeing more people who are detained by Customs and Border Protection dying. Absolutely. Um, if I remember just a few days ago, I think we have a report of uh, another child under the age of 10 dying. Um, and there are some great articles that are being written specifically on that phenomena, and they are being directly correlated to not only the physical policies being passed by federal and local administrations, but the narratives by Donald Trump, for instance, saying that these people are just coming here to hurt other humans, when in actuality they're coming here because they are hurt, because they want a chance to just live like we all deserve. So that in itself, the um, symbolism that that's setting precedent of is it's historically akin to a dictator and a fascist, and it's very, very clear and very scary. One of the policies that President Trump is implementing through Twitter, at least he says he is, is that he will deport one million migrants. 
Yes, uh, if I read correctly, uh, with his uh, one of his last couple of Twitters, I think that's the one talking about how he wants to start next week, um, putting more funds and uh, training officers to be more aggressive in not only deterring migrants that have yet to come here who are running for their lives, but taking out the valuable community members that have already made their lives here, contributed to all of our communities by making them better, by making them more diverse, by making them more loving with the skills and the family that they bring here. And those are the people that he wants to continue to go after even more aggressively. And we've, um, there was, there, for instance, it's not just about the fact that, you know, he's the history of the freedom of movement that until just literally the last few decades has been disrupted, but also how this disrupts the innate social relationships of human beings. When you have, for instance, a citizen bystander in the United States, often in a Greyhound bus or in an apartment complex, witnessing these armed looking like riot police officers going into the homes of their neighbors in front of their children, ripping them out while they are screaming that when they go back to where they were originally from, they will be murdered or worse. It's, it puts human beings in a psychological state of cognitive dissonance that makes it so that you're not sure what to do when your basic instincts tell you what is right. When you see someone screaming being dragged out of their home for no other reason than they were not born here, obviously any sane person, any person that has a heart will want to stop that. But the fear of being murdered themselves, the fear of being detained themselves, put into a cage themselves is a deterrence that's not just to people that aren't from here, but people that are as well. And that's something we all should be deeply concerned about and take action against. And finally, what would you recommend? How, what kind of migration policy should the United States have? Well, for, um, for me personally, with all that I've studied and with all that I've seen, not only um, socially, culturally, institutionally, and economically, will the United States and every other country in the world be hurt by not allowing the freedom of movement, and that doesn't mean that we don't have, like for instance, the airport system. We already literally have systems that are set up to let people in freely while just checking, um, and mind you, there are huge issues with uh, racial profiling and institutional um, injustice in that system as well, and that needs to be reformed immediately. But we already have systems in place like TSA and um, all these different machines that literally you can see if someone has a weapon on them. It's not that difficult. You can check if someone has a history of violence. It's not that difficult. And if they do have a history of violence, that doesn't mean we need to put them in a cage. That doesn't mean we can't let them in this country whose borders are literally historically new and made up. But that means that we can put, instead of billions of dollars into bombing, for instance, countries that we have not declared war on even every day, we can put that money into rehabilitation centers, into education centers, into medical centers, where we can actually make it so that even if someone had a violent past, we have all the resources to make their future not that way, to give them a chance at contributing to the love and culture and community that we have here and need here. And other than that, there is nothing that we need to make sure. Well, those are my only questions. Is there anything else that people should know about uh, about uh, immigration? Um, I, uh, just as a last thought, I would ask that for any person um, listening, for any human with a beating heart, to really take into consideration what would you do if you were in a situation where your life was at risk? or your family was at risk, would you stay? Or would you go for not even guaranteed safety, but a chance at just living? And living in the United States for someone that's not from here often means 
living in hiding, living like Anne Frank in a closet, um, hoping that no one hears you when all you want to do is be free. Just imagine that and ask yourself, what would you do before you support a policy or a person that makes it so that individual is much more likely to be murdered? Thanks so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you.